Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. We are uh, going to continue our series today called There Is More. It's kind of our theme for this whole year at the church. And we're basing it off of this verse here in Ephesians, where the Apostle Paul says, he says, prayer for us is that, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, Last week we talked about faith, uh, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints. And this word always used to hang me up because, you know, you know, in the Catholic world, well, who's a saint? A saint is a holy person, right? That's a saint way out there. But you know, you're a saint. The Bible says you are a saint because of Christ and his gift. You're a saint. You say, well, I don't feel very saintly. Well, it's all right. He sees you as a saint. So start living that. Start living like one. Okay. So it says, the saints, what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth? And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, this is a lofty proposition here. Because when you think of what is the fullness of all the fullness of God, what does that mean? Well, here, here's the reality of this. Did you know that right now you are already filled with all the fullness of God? When you accept Christ, the fullness of God's spirit comes to live in you. And I don't understand theologically what all happens, philosophically, metaphysically. I don't understand it all. But I know this, the spirit of God, he comes to live in you. And everything you need from God, he's already placed inside of you. So the goal of our lifetime is learning how to become aware of his work within us, which is last week why I described faith as this ever-increasing awareness that leads to transformation. And again, that's one element of it. I've been getting some feedback this week. Some people like uh, said, I don't know if I like your definition of faith. I was like, that's cool. I'm not sure I like it either. So uh, uh, my wife, she was like, I don't know about your definition of faith. So we've been going back and forth, but it's like, what is faith? And I just really believe that faith is having this ever-increasing awareness that the fullness of God's spirit lives in you. So what does that mean and how you live out your life? But what an encouraging thing to know that everything you need is already within you because the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you you. So last week we talked about there's more for your faith. This week I want to talk about how there's more for your finances. When uh, at, at our wedding reception, uh, the whole church was invited and we had a bunch of people at our wedding. And this lady walked up to me, friend of our family at the reception, and she handed me a check and she said, congratulations on getting married. I was like, oh, thank you. Thank you. And I opened up the check. It was for $40 written out to the church. You ever seen that Seinfeld episode where George doesn't want to give people Christmas gifts, so he gives them a little certificate that says a, a donation has been made to the human fund in your name? And everybody's like, what's the human fund? They look it up. It doesn't even exist. He just didn't want to give out gifts. I'm like, I felt like that's what this was. It's like, like, here's my tithe. Can you give it to the church in your name? I'm like, wait a second. So I was like, well, this is to the church. And she goes, well, you work for the church, so I want to make sure I get tax credit for giving to you. I'm not kidding. This actually happened. I'm like, and I'm like, it's 40 bucks, lady. Like, thanks for the gift, but really? So I found the accountant for a church who happened to be in the reception. I went to her and I was like, hey, uh, she wrote this check to me for the church. And she's like, well, technically you can't do that, but whatever. She's like, that sounds like her. She's like, she doesn't ever give, but when she does, she wants to make sure she gets credit. And I thought, wow. So I, I got to know the family a little better, this family. And uh, a friend of ours who worked for them I told her this story one time, and she goes, yep, that sounds about right. She said, they're incredibly wealthy, but everything they do is driven by the dollar. Every decision they make is driven by money, 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 money. And I thought, man, that's really interesting because here's a wealthy person, but you know, in my mind, if every decision you make is impacted or controlled by someone else or something else, that's slavery, and what's wild is, this was an incredibly wealthy woman, but it seemed to me like she was a slave to money because every decision was based on money. And you know, you can be a slave to pretty much anything. In fact, there's this verse where the Apostle Paul, he says, you guys used to be slaves to sin, where sin controlled your every behavior. But when the Spirit of Christ came in you, you weren't a slave anymore to sin. Now it says you're a bondservant. He tells Timothy, he's like, you're a bondservant. You're a slave of Christ. So now Christ's life within you should be driving your actions and controlling. Because the bottom line is we humans, we're always going to be a slave to something. That's just the bottom line. You can't get out of slavery. So that's where Paul says this. He says, look, guys, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. So stand firm then and don't let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. 
It says, Christ set you free from the power of sin in your life. Now, I want you to be stay in that freedom. But there's this tendency we all have to go back to financial or to bondage. And one of the areas that that's most clear is in, in the financial realm. And, and make no mistake, it is very easy to be in bondage to money. In fact, there's this verse that King Solomon, he says this, he says, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is the slave of the lender. Now, you'll notice this doesn't say borrowing money is sin. Thank God for that. Because sometimes, you know, you just got to take out a loan, right? But he does say, here's the principle. And principles, the beautiful thing about them is they're flexible because they say, if you do this, you'll get this outcome. And he basically says, if you borrow money, you will become the slave of the person that lends you the money. And some of y'all know what that's like, right? You're like, oh my gosh, they're calling again. Where's my money? Or you kept getting that fifth notice in the mail from the thing. We're about to turn this over to the collection agency. You feel like a slave to them. You know, the worst is when like you've borrowed money from a family member. That's the worst. Pro tip, don't borrow money from family. Because then you get to these Thanksgiving gathering and you show up, you know, with your new Apple watch and they're like, did you buy that with my money? You're like, like, dad, I thought you lent me that with no strings attached. You know, There's never no strings attached because the borrower is always slave to the lender. And the challenge we have, because I believe God wants to set us free financially in every area of our life, that freedom that he gave within us, he wants to set us free financially, but it can be really challenging because some, sometimes we get in situations where it's like, man, I just don't have the money I need. So we're going to talk about today what I believe is God's vision for your finances, but understanding that at any given point, you can fall quickly into slavery to money. And it gets really tricky because I was talking to a guy this week that he runs a, a big camp. Huge, huge, huge organization. They get a lot of money in. And he was walking me around the camp and he's like, yeah, this, this thing over here tends to lose us money over here. And I'm like, wait a second. So you keep it open knowing it willingly, like it, it loses you money. And he goes, yeah. He's like, but it serves the mission of our, what our mission is. So we count on other things to make money to fund the mission over there. And I thought that's an interesting truth because so many times we get so focused on the bean counting. Does it make sense financially? But there are some things in life that they just aren't going to make sense financially, but they improve, they, they, they're in line with the mission of what God's called you to do. So you have to do other things to supplement it. But it can be quickly easy to fall into slavery to the money and miss out on your mission because you're so focused on the money. So it's this constant balance we're having to figure out. And when I think about slavery, the thing that comes to mind, obviously, is the children of Israel. You know the story of the children of Israel? Jacob, he has all these sons. He's got one son named Joseph. They sell him into slavery. He ends up getting sold into slavery in Egypt. Well, a famine hits way up here in Israel. And Jacob says, go down. They, they think Joseph's dead at this point. They go, go down here and see if you can get some resources from Egypt. They come down here and they realize God sent Joseph ahead to save their whole family. Joseph's the second most powerful man in Egypt. And he says, you guys come live here. I'm going to take care of you. And we're going to get through this famine. Well, they get down there and they start living there. And they, they, they just, they start popping out a lot of kids, kind of like Jeremiah. And I'm just kidding. Just kidding. I agree with Jeremiah too, man. Children are a blessing from the Lord. If you're sitting here this morning wondering if you should have kids because you're like, how do I raise a kid in this world? Trust me on this. If God gives you a child, you have what you need to raise that child in this world. And that child was born for such a time as this. So don't be afraid. Okay. I was, I was afraid to have a, a child and I'm definitely afraid to have five, but, uh, but children really are an inheritance from the Lord. So anyways, they start having all these kids and the, the Pharaoh's like, whoa, hold up. There's more of them than us. So he's like, we need to make, we need to enslave them. So they put the children of Israel in slavery for hundreds of years. And then Moses comes and says, guys, God doesn't intend you to live in slavery. We're going to come and we're going to set you free from that slavery. And, and, and here's my take. I think most of us are in financial slavery. I mean, I'm, honestly, if we were to be honest, probably eight out of 10 of us in this room, we're in a position of financial slavery because our decisions and how we live and where we're living are dictated by our finances. And sometimes it's slavery we've sold ourselves into voluntarily. And make no mistake, there are people who benefit in this world from you being in slavery, particularly financially. Because it's financial slavery that keeps you making those payments on that car. And honestly, a lot of us, our greatest slavery is to that thing parked in our driveway. I was talking to a girl the other day, single mom. She just got a real estate license. She was telling me about all of her financial woes. I said, man, where, where are some areas we can trim off some of your finances? And she said, I was like, how much is your, like, is your car paid for? She said, no, no, I just got a new one. I'm like, oh, a new one? She's like, yeah, yeah. I was like, how much is that payment? She said, $6.75 a month. And I was like, what? 
She's like, yeah, well, I'm a, you know, I'm a realtor, so I need to look impressive, so I got a BMW. And I was like, what? Like, she's like, yeah, it's just so stressful. And then she tells me she leased it. And I'm like, wait, so you're not even going to get to keep the thing? She's like, no, no. I'm like, oh, my gosh, you're going to need to get that off the, the record. They're like, you need to get that off of your, your bills. Well, I signed a three-year contract, but I'll have a reliable car. And I'm like, yeah, and you're going to be a slave. And you're always going to be worried about how to make that payment. And you're always going to have to be hustling more and more to make that payment. Now, listen, there's nothing wrong with driving a nice car. Don't get me wrong. Nothing wrong with leasing a car. I don't think it's the most fiscally responsible thing to do, but there's nothing wrong with that. But know this, if it's making you a slave to money where, where you can't do certain things because you have to pay for that car, that car owns you. And that's where Jesus comes along and he says, look, uh, it's, it's for freedom that I've set you free. And, and, and this is the really challenging part. Okay, look. There's certain slavery that we don't even realize we're in. In fact, I think the worst kind of slavery is slavery we don't even realize we're in. There's this lady named Ruby K. Payne. She's the most, one of the most brilliant women I've ever met. She wrote a book called A Framework for Understanding Poverty. And her basic premise is this. You learn things growing up about money, about relationships, about people, about the world that is caught rather than taught. In fact, most of how we see the world, you just caught it by watching your parents they didn't teach you. They didn't say, now son, now daughter, here's how things work. You just kind of watched them and you're like, oh, that's, a, that's why I tell people all the time, you're like wondering why your, your kids won't obey you. It's because they're too busy watching you. They're not listening to you because they, they're watching you, right? And they see your actions. So your kids pay attention and you catch more of what's going on than what you're taught. And she says that there's certain things, Kiyosaki, Robert Kiyosaki wrote a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And he basically says that there's certain things that you learn about money from growing up with parents who understand how money works that you don't get as somebody who grew up in poverty. And if you don't learn it, you just don't know what you don't know. It's not your fault. You just don't know what you don't know. So you have to actively pursue more knowledge about finances. Well, Ruby, Ruby Payne, she basically says this. She says, there's so many areas that the way you grew up, your socioeconomic class, where your financial state was, that you don't even realize is impacting you. And she gives this huge list. And I know you can't read this because it's really small. So I'm going to read it to you, right? She says it impacts everything and you don't even realize it. One of the things she says, like in poverty, the most important possessions are people. You ain't got no money, but you got family. So they'll bail you out. And you always protect the relationships, which is why you're bailing out your uncle for the fifth time, because you may need him to bail you out one day. So people, man, that's the most important thing. Now, this is a beautiful thing, honestly, except when it's not. And you're facilitating bad behavior in the family by not loving them at a distance because you're afraid of what if they're not there for me when I need something and so you're always coming in and backing them up. It's a poverty mindset. That's the way poverty works. And she says, in the middle class, the important thing is things. And you can see this very easily by driving into any neighborhood. And you see that people have a beautiful house. They've got three cars out front, one in the driveway. The garage is full of stuff. Garages are actually for cars. Did you know that? The garage is full of stuff. They've got a boat parked over to the side. They're paying for RV storage down the street. And then they're paying $120 a month for a storage unit down the road to hold all their crap. Middle class, baby. Middle class slavery is what that is. Things are the most important thing. Then in wealth, it's one of a kind objects, legacies. That's why you see them bidding on that. I'm a, I bid $3 million on that piece of art, but I'm the only one that owns that piece of art. Here's what she says. In your lifetime, there's a very good chance you will either go up or down one socioeconomic class, and there's a very good chance you will marry somebody from another socioeconomic class. So she wrote a book called Crossing the Tracks for Love, where she says a lot of the struggles people have in their marriage is they bring these unrealized mindsets into their marriage specifically about money, but all sorts of other things. And they don't realize that it's impacting how they see things. You're like, well, why, you know, so if you came from wealth, so here's an example. Money in poverty is to be used and spent. You're poor and you get some money in, you're like, hey, let's use it to entertain ourselves. So I talked to this girl one time, she came up to me in tears. I'd spoken at a financial event in Houston. She came up to me in tears and she was, you just explained my life. She said, my husband and I together make a combined 250,000 a year and we live paycheck to paycheck. I said, what? And she goes, but you explained why. She said, my dad, when we were growing up, every Friday that he'd get a paycheck, we would go to Astro World and we would all get the big sip cups. We'd go on every ride. We'd get all of our meals there. And then Monday we'd come home and the electricity would get shut off because he didn't have money to pay the bill. She said, we lived to alleviate our pleasure with money. And she said, now my husband and I, we've got that same mindset. She's like, I know we shouldn't be living paycheck to paycheck. She's but I'll have a bad week and I'll go spend $5,000 at Saks Fifth Avenue on a Saturday. She's like, I'm struggling. I'm like, oh, rough. That's tough, right? Rough. <laughs> but she was poor in her mind. 
And this is what I want to get into. You can have a ton of money and still have a poverty mindset, just like my friend who gave me that $40 check. But you can also be, I mean, you can also be poor financially and still have a wealth mindset. And that's what I think God wants to get out of you. And so she says, there's all these things that are, in, in poverty, your personality is valued for its entertainment. Oh, excuse me, in middle class, money is, is to be managed. This is why middle class, like, man, if I can just get my money in those stocks and I'll have all this money by the time I'm, I can retire by the time I'm 59 and a half. And in, in wealth, it's to be conserved and invested. So I have this friend who's very, 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 very wealthy. If I said his name, you'd know exactly who he is because his name is on signs all over the place. And he told me, he said, you know what stinks about my life? He said, I spend 90% of my time with lawyers and CPAs trying to figure out how to keep people from taking my money. And he's like, it is such a burden. And I know some of you would be like, I'd like to have that burden. But as the rapper said, more money, more problems. There's some serious irritating things that come with money. And I'm, sometimes I'm like, I wish I had those problems. But man, I mean, wealth has some things that come with it. That's because they're focusing on how to stay uh, conserved. So this book, I mean, she just goes through everything, right? Like she talks about in poverty, humor is, is about people and sex. In poverty, middle class, or in a middle class, humor is about situations. That's why on TV, sitcom situation comedies, that's why they're so popular because we used to have a middle class in America. Um, in the wealth, it's about social faux pas. Can you believe she showed up to there wearing that? You don't wear that in May, right? Like, what I think is fascinating is food. In poverty, the key question is, did you have enough? Quantity is important. Did you get enough food? In the middle class, it's, hey, did you like it? Did it taste good? And in wealth, it's like, was it presented well? That's why you go to that place, it's like $70 a plate, and there's like a tiny piece of steak with some parsley. And you're like, is that the appetizer? No, that's the meal. Isn't it presented lovely? So here's my point with all this. There's all this stuff you bring to the table that was, you caught and you didn't, you didn't even understand, like you didn't even know it was there. And a lot of times what we bring to the table is a mindset of poverty because we just don't understand how money works. And you have to actively seek out ways to learn and which is where God wants to take us to freedom. So Moses came in and said, guys, God doesn't intend for you to be in slavery. And he takes him to freedom and he's ready to take him straight into the promised land. But the problem is they still have poverty in their mindset. 400 years, that's generations of poverty that have been there and they've got to unlearn some things. So he's like, all right, go take the land. I'm going to give it to you. And only two guys, Joshua and Caleb are like, yeah, we can take them. And the rest of them are like, oh, we don't have what it takes. We don't have a conqueror's mind. They didn't have a conqueror's mindset. And God's like, I can't send you in there and bless you until you're out of slavery in your mind. And I believe that's what he wants for all of us this year but it's going to take some active participation in your own survival. You're not just going to naturally get it because you're going to have to learn a new way of thinking. That's one of the beautiful things. We've got a financial peace class starting here very soon. It's Dave Ramsey. And some of you go, oh, I've tried Dave Ramsey. Really? Have you really tried? Because if you've tried, it actually is a really helpful thing, right? And Dave Ramsey, man, he is focused on getting people out of slavery and into freedom. And that's why he's so dogmatic about it. He says, one of the first keys into freedom is you got to get a budget. You got to know what you have to deal with. I was coaching a girl one time. She was wanting to start a business and she was trying to get out of debt. And I said, how much debt do you have? And she's like, I don't even want to know. I was like, sweetheart, you're going to have to figure that out before we can go anywhere. You got to be honest about how much debt you have and what you can do before you can get out of it. And if you don't, with the children of Israel, what's interesting is it was, they had to go kind of slim living for a while. They lived day to day. They would, God would never let them store up more food than they needed, except on the Sabbath day, the day before Sabbath, they could store it for two days. But he said, I'm going to give you the food you need for this day. And a lot of times the time to getting into freedom is a time of retraction. And you go, but I can't just go out and spend whatever I want in the credit card. No, not anymore. Because you're trying to get free. The long game here is freedom. And it's so easy to go back into slavery. I cannot tell you how many people I talk to that, man, I was just talking to some people uh, earlier this week and they said, yeah, man, we had this car accident. The insurance paid off the car. It's amazing. It was a car we shouldn't have been able to afford anyways. We're out of debt, man. And now we're like really in good position. So we're going to go ahead and go get a loan on, on, on a new car. And I'm like, God just set you free. Why are you doing that? And how, I cannot tell you how many people I've talked to that go in and, in and out of debt, in and out of debt because their desires, it's again, it goes voluntarily selling them back into slavery. Their desires are like, well, I really want that. What's an extra $400 a month? We have it now. But then $400 adds up and you start justifying and little by little, you're back in slavery when God is like, no, I want to set you free financially. But it takes sometimes living lean, cutting back. Dave Ramsey calls it living with gazelle intensity on getting out of debt, making wise decisions. Yeah, it would be nice to have a nicer car, but I'm going to drive my old clunker truck because it gets me where I need to go. And man, it's, extra, it's nice having an extra $400 a month in an emergency fund. 
When you've got an emergency fund, there's a whole lot less emergencies that happen. It's the weirdest thing. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing, yeah. So he, the goal here is to go to freedom, but I don't think that's where, uh, where, where God wants it to stop, right? He says, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, then don't let yourselves go back into slavery. But then there's another step. And the step is to go from not only freedom, where you're out of debt, but you have a vision for something greater with your finances where you can be even more generous and where you can set up a legacy. There's a, there's, a, there's a verse that says, a godly man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And some of you go, man, I don't even know how I could hand any money down. I'm just going to hand debt down to my family. Look, it's not impossible to get out of that. In fact, did you know this? Like, I think it's like 90% of millionaires in America have never made more than $100,000 in any given year. That's encouraging to me because I'm in that category. But I learned something from a bunch of wealthy guys. I took them hiking a few years ago. And one of the guys, they, they taught me two important things. But one of the things they taught me is this. They said, look, you're only as wealthy as how much money is still rolling in once the paycheck dries up. I was like, what are you talking about? And they said, there's something called passive income. And passive income is where you've invested in something that keeps paying you even apart from your job. So owning a rental house creates passive income. Having a side business can create passive income where money keeps coming in, where even if you were to lose your job tomorrow, you're not going to be destitute and down to zero. And passive income is what is part of financial conquests, is where you start to go, okay, God's given me some resources. We're out of debt, but now I'm going to start taking those resources. I'm not going to just consume them all on myself. In fact, there's this verse, there's a story, a parable where Jesus told about a, a, a master and he left money to three guys, three of his servants, and two of them doubled their money, but then one of them buried it. And, and God said to him, you wicked servant, you, why did you bury that money? At least put it in the bank and get 1% interest. He, he lived in the same, same times we did where you get 1% interest in the bank, right? So you could have at least gotten 1% interest in the bank, but you just like broke even. And, and the parable seems to me to indicate that breaking even isn't enough in the kingdom of God. We're expected to do something with what we're given. And God will bless it if we do something with it. But there's this, there's this thing that Jesus said. This was when... You know, I think we need to do a series sometime called Savage Jesus. Because Jesus, man, he was sweet and loving and compassionate, but there were some things that he said that you're like, dude, that's brutal. That wasn't very Jesus-like of you, Jesus. But he said some things. I mean, there's this one line, he said this. He said, look, for the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Now, I wish that wasn't in there. Right? I, I, maybe like the communist thing would be like, for the one who has, the government will take it from them and give it to those who don't have. That ain't in there, but this is what Jesus says. And what he's saying is if you'll take personal responsibility for your finances and, he, and you can show that you're responsible enough that when he gives it to you, you're gonna make something from it, he'll give you even more. But if you take everything you have and squander it on yourself, even when you're in a place of freedom, if all you're doing is squandering it and not investing it in something that creates a return, he's gonna take even what you had from you. And I don't think he's going to do it like God's up there. I'm going to take from them. I think it's just a law he put in, in place. I don't think he's up there vindictively trying to take from you. He just says, this is just the nature of the world. So much of what Jesus taught was just the nature of the world. He said, this is how it rolls. And Mark, Pastor Marcus said it this way. He said, you know, if God can get it to you, he can get it, get it through you, he, he'll get it to you. Like if he knows that when he gives you the resources, you're going to use it for good, he's going to give you the ability to, con to, to conquer. And that's what I think God wants for all of us is this place of financial conquest where it's not just that we're free and we've got extra money to spend on ourselves, but we actually start creating resources that are able to bless others, bless our family for generations, giving something to our kids that they can give to their kids, training our kids in those ways. We aren't called to just break even or just make it or pass debt onto our kids. We're called to be financial conquerors and it's not so we can use it on ourselves. It's so that we can be a blessing to others. Amen. But you have to first get out of slavery. Right. And honestly, probably eight out of 10 of us are in here saying, man, I, I'm here. I, I need to get out of here. And if, you, if you're in that place, I would say, look, to get to freedom, you're going to have to get really serious about this. And one of the things you can do is go to our financial peace class that's starting next month. We've got some brilliant money managers in our church, people that understand how money works, and they will train you a whole new way of thinking, ways you don't even know. You just don't even know you can think about money that way. And they'll get you to freedom. And some of you, you're at the place of freedom right now, and you're like, you're just using it all on yourself, and you're the one that's storing up the next year boat. And, oh, man, my next thing, I'm going to get a new motorcycle so I can stick it in, in my storage unit. Oh, I'm going to have to get a new storage unit so I can spend 120 bucks, right? And, like, and you're just creating this self-perpetuating cycle where you've got the money, but you're just blowing it on yourself rather than creating something that continues to grow and make more. I believe this is where God wants us at a place of conquest. But, but here's what he says. He says, listen, if you'll follow my structure, you know, if you get out of debt, stay in freedom. He says this, eventually you're going to come to a place 
were a blessing. And he says, but make sure you remember this. When the Lord your God brings you into the land he swore to your fathers, this is what he's telling Israel when they're in the desert. He says, pretty soon you're going to become, fine. You're going to become conquerors. You're going to take this land and it's going to produce fruit for you and your family. But he says, when you do that, when uh, that you get to the land that he swore to your father, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you a land, large, flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. When you see some serious success because you made some serious financial decisions, then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you don't forget the Lord. I talked about last week how the only difference between the rich and the poor is the rich just get a longer rope to hang themselves with. They make the same dumb mistakes, but they've got money to buy off their mistakes and buffer themselves from the pain of those mistakes. Yeah, everybody makes the same mistakes. He says, man, when you've got money, that's where Jesus, he, don't, he wasn't saying that money's bad. He's just saying when you've got money, it's really hard to get into the kingdom of God because money can come, sometimes become your master. And I want to be your master. And I don't want you to fall back into slavery. And so that's what he says. He says, remember the Lord your God who brought you out of this slavery, out of the land of, out of Egypt, out of slavery. It's my encouragement for you guys this, this year. I want to encourage you, man. Some of you, you're in, in slavery and you're going, you can't even imagine. Your, your mom, your grandpa, all of them, they, you've just, you've grown up seeing debt, 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 debt. I don't believe you have to do, you live that way. I believe if you'll get wise, start taking the little bit you've got, God can take it. And if you take, get serious about being a good steward of it, a good manager of it, God can take it. And he can take you to a place financially you could have never managed, imagined, a place of freedom. Some of you right now, you grew up in poverty and you're actually making money. So you're actually technically in the middle class or maybe the upper class, but you've still got a poverty mindset here and money's still ruling you. My belief is this year you can break free from that. I don't want you to have that poverty in your mind because poverty in your mind is almost in some ways worse than actual poverty of money because it's always limiting you. But I believe that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has perceived what God has in store for those who put their trust in him, not in money, but their trust in him. There's no upper limit to where God wants to take you in your finances and not just for you, but so you can pass that blessing on to your church, to your kids, to generation after generation, because it was for freedom that Christ set you free in every area of your life, emotionally, relationally, financially. And my prayer for you guys is that this will be a church where we're not just people that are in the place of financial freedom. We are financial conquerors, creating resources that advance the kingdom, advance the mission. And you say, yeah, there's certain things that, man, we just, we just give that money away. We know there's not going to be any return on investment temporally, but we know eternally there's an return on investment. And that's my prayer for all of you. And some of you say, I can't even imagine I could get there. Trust me, you can do this. You really can do this, but it's going to take getting serious. First of all, humbly recognizing, I've made a mess of my finances. I've made some bad mistakes. You know, that those steward, that, that parable of the steward, the steward that made the bad choices with the money and didn't do anything with it. Jesus, uh, the, the master said to him, now I'm going to send you to where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And people are like, was that hell? No, that's not hell. Weeping and gnashing of teeth is a Hebrewism for a place of regret. And my prayer for you is at the end of your life, you don't go, ah, the regret of what could have been. Yeah, I got that boat, but what, what else could I have done with that money? Yeah, I got that motorcycle. We went on that vacation, but what else could we have done with that money? And I'm not saying don't enjoy your life. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying don't be a slave to that next thing that you think you need. Don't let money dictate you. Be a slave to the will of God and let him dictate what you're going to do with those finances. Money is a tremendous gift from the Lord, but it can also be a horrible taskmaster. So my prayer is for freedom for all of us that we not just get free, but also become financial conquerors this year. We are going to have classes starting in February, financial peace classes. And, and let me tell you what typically happens in this classes. Been hanging out in the church for 45 years. I've seen this. The people that show up at those classes are the people who already got their financial stuff in order and they become even more successful. And the people who really need the class don't show up because it's just too overwhelming to them. Don't be that person, please. Show up at the freaking class. <laughs> Do the stuff. You will see blessing and benefit in your life. I guarantee it. As somebody... I'm no millionaire, but man, the Lord has been tremendously good to our family. Um, and we just, when people see what the Lord's done for us, I'm like, I don't know how he did it, but I do know this, that we've done our best to be financial conquerors with the little bit we've got. And I believe he wants the same thing for you. You guys receive that? Let me pray for it. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. 
May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.